News of the Times. Frightful Fridays. Murders at Yarmouth. Welcome to News of the Times. Yarmouth, referred to by Dickens and David Copperfield, remains a seaside resort known for its natural beauty and a perfect place for a holiday. But underneath the beach front stalls, yacht clubs and children's amusements, there lurks a killer. Today, we look at two cases that take place some 12 years apart. The killings are similar in their unique execution and terrorised this seaside resort. Was the wrong man hung in the first murder, allowing the real murderer to kill again 12 years later, or was there a copycat killer lurking in their midst? We take a look at the two murders at Yarmouth in today's episode of Frightful Fridays. We take a look at the two murders at Yarmouth in today's episode of Frightful Fridays. We hope you enjoy the show. The Yarmouth Beach Mystery 1900 This sensational case took place in Yarmouth in 1900. It had all the elements to attract a wide audience. A bigamous, somewhat seedy man, his attractive wife, an illicit affair, and the mysterious strangled corpse of his wife found on the beach. Setting the scene. Herbert John Bennett was born into a working-class family with ambitions to raise himself above his station. When he was 17, he was pressured to marry the pregnant 20-year-old Mary Jane Clark. The marriage does not seem to have been a happy one. The child she had been pregnant with was stillborn, although another child, Ruby, survived. Herbert tried his hand at many jobs, but seemed to have been most comfortable as a con man. One of the many cons he employed involved buying very cheap violins and reselling them at a considerable markup to the students his musical wife tutored. Questions surround Mary Jane's complicity in his various schemes. At one point, the Bennets moved to Cape Town in South Africa under the names of Mr. and Mrs. Hood. It is unknown what they did whilst there. The travel may have been to remove themselves temporarily from the scene of the crime. A grocer's shop Bennett had bought mysteriously burnt to the ground one week later, giving him a considerable insurance payout. Upon their return, their relationship looks to have continued to spiral downwards. Testimony was given from one of their landladies, stating she had overheard Mary Jane warning Bennett, I can get you fifteen years, with his response being, I wish you were dead, and if you are not careful, you will soon be. The Bennets separated, living at different residences. Bennett took up with a parlour maid, Alice Meadows, who believed she had engaged herself with a true gentleman, a real step up from her job as parlour maid. In August, Bennett and new girlfriend Alice Meadows vacationed in Yarmouth. Bennett proposed to Alice and was ecstatically accepted. They were to wed. September the 15th, Mary Jane received a letter from Bennett requesting she go to Yarmouth under the old alias that had been used before Mrs. Hood. She and her little girl Ruby travelled and stayed in the lodging place of Mrs. Rudrum. She remained under the guise of Mrs. Hood. On September the 21st, Mary Jane, as Mrs. Hood, had an evening appointment with a man. That man was unseen by others, although she was overheard speaking with him. September the 22nd, having received a letter earlier in the day, Mary Jane, still as Mrs. Hood, left for an appointment. She wore her long gold chain, silver watch, jewellery, and brought with her quite a large sum of cash. 
She and a man later identified as Bennett were seen in a pub by the landlord in that evening. Bennett and Mary Jane possibly were again spotted on the beach roughly an hour later, but it was never confirmed that it was actually the victim and Bennett. On September the 23rd, Mary Jane, under the guise of Mrs Hood, was found strangled on the beach by a mohair bootlace with a particular knot. It was difficult to determine if she had been sexually assaulted. Nobody knew who the dead young woman was, as Mrs Hood, as she had been known, did not really exist. Bennett, however, was busy. He went to London, where Mary Jane had been staying and collected all her belongings. He told Mary Jane's landlady that Mary Jane was going to America and no longer needed her rooms. He gave Alice Meadows Mary Jane's jewellery and clothes, stating that they had been given to him from a cousin who was moving to South Africa. He made no mention to police that he knew the dead woman found on a beach in Yarmouth, which by now was making national headlines. On November the 5th, a clever detective spotted a laundry mark on the clothing of the now-dead Mrs Hood. This was subsequently traced back, establishing her true identity, Mary Jane Bennett. From here... Investigations took place tracing her husband, Herbert John Bennett. From the Lloyd's Weekly newspaper, November 1900, The Strangulation of the Mystery Woman at Yarmouth Beach. It was on Sunday morning, September the 23rd, that a man strolling along Yarmouth Beach in search of shells came upon the dead body of a young and pretty woman. It lay below the Barrack Drive, a favourite walk along the front for cooing couples. A quick investigation showed that death was not a result of suicide. The body had not been in the sea, and in the area around the body there was evident signs of a struggle, and tightly fastened around the woman's neck was a mohair shoelace doubly fastened with a sailor's knot. It was soon decided that she had been taken to that lonely spot and strangled. All that was substantially found out about her was not much, except that she was a visitor and a few details of her movements and statements during her short stay comprised all that could be gleaned. She was a woman who dressed in summer clothing and carrying a little girl of two years had only a week before taken a room at the house of Mrs. Rudrum and paid ten shillings in advance for it. A railway return ticket subsequently found showed that she had travelled from Liverpool Street first class, but the only luggage she had was a paper parcel with a change of linen. The Dead Woman's History Mr. William Clark Butcher of Northfleet called at Woolwich Police Station. His son, he said, was that morning reading from a daily paper the account of the arrest of Bennett. It occurred to him that the murdered woman may be his daughter. He produced a photograph of his daughter and the man she married. He stated that his daughter married Herbert John Bennett four years ago. The police recognised the portrait as the man they had in custody. The dead woman that had been found on the beach was Mary Jane Bennett. The photograph was without a moustache, the accused having grown one since. When it became evident that the murdered woman was really his daughter, Mr Clark burst into uncontrollable grief, and on partially recovering was sent with Detective Sergeant Holford to Scotland Yard to see Chief Inspector Leach. Mr Clark described his daughter, who at the time of her death was only 23, as being of a very loving nature. She was a teacher of music when she had met Bennett, who came to her for lessons, 
an attachment sprung up between them, and they became secretly engaged to each other. Bennett was at that time a grocer's assistant in the North Fleet Cooperative Stores. The engagement between the murdered girl and Bennett had gone on for twelve months before the grandmother was made aware of it, when the girl had to confess that she was pregnant. The grandmother, greatly distressed, urged Bennett to marry the girl. This, at least, he consented to do, and in order to avoid publicity, they were privately married at the registrar's office at Leighton. Bennett and his wife moved to Battersea, where he opened a small shop for coal, green grocery, sweets and other articles. He had with him at that time his wife's brother, a boy of about 12 years of age, to carry out goods. This boy, William Clark, alleges that Bennett and his wife lived a most unhappy life, and he often found his sister crying and very unhappy at the way in which her husband treated her. Bennett always carried a revolver, and on one occasion pointed it as if in play at his wife's face, pulling the trigger and snapping it. Mrs. Bennett was very much frightened, and so was her brother, as he knew one barrel was loaded. Bennett's Sweetheart More dramatic still was the discovery of another link of evidence. A young girl called at Woolwich Police Station to ask if she could see Bennett. She was his sweetheart, she said. She gave her name as Miss Alice Meadows. It was in June that Alice got to know Bennett. She met him first at his lodgings, and the acquaintance was formed through some friend of a fellow servant of Meadows who lived at the lodgings in Union Street. The acquaintance ripened, and at last the two became formally engaged. He gave her an engagement ring of diamonds and rubies and took her away for a holiday in August. The two went to Yarmouth at the beginning of that month. It was arranged that the marriage was to take place in June of next year, but after September, when the murder took place, Bennett began to be very urgent, and ultimately the bands were arranged to be put up at church next Sunday, and a house for the pair had been taken at Charlton. On Tuesday, the police went to Woolwich and arrested the young man named Herbert John Bennett. Although only a labourer at the arsenal, he, in his hours of leisure, sported a frock coat and a silk hat. He was identified as the husband of the dead woman and then owned to it. When Chief Inspector Leach and Inspector Gummer of Scotland Yard formally charged him with murder, he gave an emphatic denial. Herbert John Bennett apprehended. Herbert John Bennett, described as 21, was duly charged with the murder of his wife at Yarmouth in September last by strangling her on the Yarmouth beach. The chief constable began his testimony by stating that when he arrested Bennett, Bennett said, what does it all mean? He was then told he would be charged with the murder of the woman found strangled on the beach at Yarmouth. To this, Bennett replied, I don't know what you mean. I've never been to Yarmouth. The chief constable then went to the accused Bennett's lodgings where he found a watch and a chain. The watch was a silver one and the chain was composed of gold and imitation pearls. These have since then, said the constable, been seen by the Rudrums at whose house the murdered woman lodged, and they were at once identified as articles she wore whilst there. From the day the body was found, said the chief constable, till the moment of his arrest, no communication was ever made or inquiry by the prisoner as to his wife, nor had he ever sent to the Rudrums since the woman's death to say that she was missing. Feelings ran high in the courtroom between Bennett's history of lying, the illicit affair, and the strangulation of what was seen as a wronged young mother. 
Additional searches in Bennett's room uncovered a receipt from the hotel he had stayed in with Alice Meadows in Yarmouth, as well as a wig and false moustache and love letters from Alice. Bennett's defence was to cast doubt on the ownership of the watch and chain found, as well as producing an unconvincing eyewitness that Bennett had been in London on the day of the crime. Bennett repeated often that he had never been to Yarmouth, a rather stupid lie that could be easily disproved. Other than regularly loudly proclaiming his innocence, Bennett did not give evidence on his own behalf during the trial, which further condemned him in the eyes of the jury. Bennett was found guilty and hanged on the 21st of March 1901, loudly proclaiming his innocence to the last. He became almost immediately an attraction at Madame Tussaud's. From the infamous Bennett case of 1900, we jump to July 1912 and the death of Dora May Gray. Like Mary Jane, Dora May had been killed with a shoelace, as well as stockings tied tightly around her throat. Like Mary Jane, Dora May's body had been left in the dunes, only some 400 feet away from where Mary Jane Bennett's body was found Twelve years earlier. Is there a sleeping serial killer living in Yarmouth? From the London Evening Standard, the 16th of July, 1912, Beach Murder. Girl found strangled with a bootlace. The discovery of a mysterious beach murder in which the victim is a girl of 17 was made at Yarmouth yesterday. The crime resembles in all essentials the Yarmouth Beach murder of 12 years ago, for which a man named Herbert Bennett suffered the death penalty. The scene of the present tragedy is the South Beach. Here, early yesterday morning, the body of a girl was found lying only six feet from the roadway of the Marine Parade Extension, death being apparently due to strangulation with a bootlace and the victim's own stocking. The police surgeon who was summoned to the scene stated that in all probability death took place at midnight on Sunday. No sign of a struggle were apparent on the beach and after a careful examination the body was removed to the mortuary in a motor car. From laundry marks on the girl's clothes she was later identified as Dora May Gray, aged 17, a day girl employed at a house in Yarmouth. She was an orphan who had been brought up by her two aunts. Living in a modest cottage in Mandaby Road, the girl was with them on Sunday, and the last they saw her alive when she left the house at eight o'clock in the evening. No clue has been discovered, and up to the present the police are entirely at a loss. A post-mortem has been held, and the doctors will report at the inquest, which will probably open today. In the crime of twelve years ago, a young woman whom Bennett had brought from London had, and had arranged to meet on the South Beach was found there on Sunday morning, similarly strangled with a bootlace. About Dora May Gray. Dora had been born illegitimate. Her mother ran away when she was a baby, and Dora had been raised by her two aunts, who described her as a good girl. She was described in the papers as about five feet four inches high, with light brown eyes and dark brown hair. She was well built. One of her centre teeth is partially decaying away, and she appeared to be about from 18 to 25 years of age. She was wearing a blue serge dress of modest make with a hat of more pretentious style. The crime had taken place during the peak holiday period, and police and officials were keen to dampen down the crime so as not to scare away the tourists, but... Amongst the locals, talk was rife with the coincidences that had taken place 
between the two murders on the beach. From the London Evening Standard, the 17th of July, 1912, Yarmouth Beach Mystery, Inquest on the Victim. No fresh facts had yet come to light to elucidate the mysterious tragedy on Yarmouth Beach. In opening the inquest last night on the victim, Dora May Gray, aged 18, the coroner could only express the hope that on a subsequent occasion evidence might be forthcoming to connect somebody with what he termed this cowardly and dastardly crime upon a poor, defenceless woman at a time when thousands were finding happiness in holiday-making. He compared the case with the Bennett crime and said that one of the girl's worsted shoelaces was as tightly fastened like a ligature as Bennett tied the bootlace around his victim's neck. Miss Selina Ann Eastick identified the body as that of her niece, whom she had had in her care since she was a baby after her mother had disappeared. The witness said that the girl had no attachment, and always had been a good girl. She had never spent a night away from home. She left the house last Sunday night at half-past seven for a walk, and said that she would not be late. Usually she returned at ten o'clock. On Monday afternoon the witness saw a newspaper and went to the police, who showed her the deceased's clothes, and she identified the body. The deceased had always been a cheerful girl. The deputy borough surveyor put in a plan showing that the body was found six feet from the parade and 300 yards beyond the Nelson Column. William Smith, a carter, described how he saw the body when driving along the parade. The girl lay flat on her back with her feet straight out and her hands by her side. Her hat was on and her clothes were in order. Sergeant Herring said that when Smith summoned him, he found the deceased's tongue protruding one inch and turned black. She had bled from the nose, and the body was cold and stiff. The hair was not disarranged, and there was no sign of a struggle. He searched over a radius of several hundred yards, but could see nothing suspicious. There were no wheel marks of any vehicle near the spot other than those made by Smith's cart. The coroner adjourned the inquiry for a week without calling medical evidence. The opinion is growing in Yarmouth that the victim was brought to the beach after being murdered. It is suggested that the absence of a signs of a struggle might be due to her being first drugged. The coroner, however, called attention to scratches on the deceased's chin, which, he said, might be due to resisting her assailant or in attempting to remove the shoelace. The other real concern that police and locals had was that they possibly had a copycat killer on their hands. From the London Evening Standard, 17th of July, 1912, Yarmouth Beach Mystery the theory of imitative murder. The murder has aroused widespread indignation and a general hope that the culprit may be captured. Surrounding the mystery of the girl's death are features of strong dramatic interest. Dora Gray has already reported in these columns left her home near the cattle market to go for a walk on Sunday evening. Of good figure and attractive appearances, she was well-dressed and looked older than her actual age of 18. While she had been in service in Manbury Road and other places, she had received numerous letters, but so far as is known, had no friends outside the family circle. From the moment she left home until she was found on the beach, strangled with her stockings and the laces from her shoe, no one appears to have seen her either with company or without. Yarmouth on Sunday evenings was, as is usual in the summer season, crowded with visitors. The girl, being young, had a habit of conversing with strangers against which she had been warned. 
The questions for the police are, in whose company did she arrive at the spot where she was found dead? Did she take off her stockings and use them with her laces to strangle herself? Was she decoyed to the spot and murdered? All the evidence points to the last of these theories. On the same beach nearly twelve years ago, a Woolwich man named Bennett murdered his wife by strangling her with a bootlace. At the time, the tragedy aroused great interest on account of the circumstantial evidence and the bold fight for Mr. Marshall Hall at the Old Bailey on Bennett's behalf. But Bennett was found guilty and was hanged. A post-mortem revealed that Dora was maiden still. There were no signs of poison and there were no wounds on her body other than some slight scratches on her chin which it was speculated had occurred when she had been fighting to take off the ligature around her neck. Then some new evidence began to arise, and it would seem that Dora was not the quiet, reserved girl her aunt had described. Instead, it appeared that Dora was a young woman attracted to the rich visiting yachters. She had been seen in the company of several men the previous week. From the London Evening Standard, the 1st of August, 1912, Beach Mystery, Remarkable Inquest Evidence, The Man in the Grey Suit, Dead Girl's Strange Adventures. The murderer of Dora Grey, the Yarmouth girl of 18 years, who was strangled with one of her own shoelaces on the South Beach 16 days ago, still remains at large and unknown. Medical evidence showed that there were no signs of a struggle, and the position of the body was quiet and reposeful. The fresh facts as to the girl's movements brought out were that she left her situation without leave for a week in June, that she had been seen on several occasions with yachtsmen, and that on the evening of Sunday the 14th of July, the night before the crime was discovered, she was observed walking towards the South Beach with a man in a grey suit. The man in the grey suit. They were seen by William Bacon, a bill poster on the Marine Parade, at about 7.45pm. They were not walking arm in arm, but were laughing and talking and going towards the South Beach. Bacon describes the man as about six foot high, and a head and shoulders taller than the girl, clean-shaven, dark-complexioned and young. He was wearing a grey suit, soft grey hat and dark brown boots. They were seen on the parade just before eight o'clock by John Harris, an attendant at the Britannic Pier. Harris described the man as about 40, rather fair and clean-shaven. He was wearing a grey suit and a straw hat. He did not think he could recognise the man again. Almost an hour later, shortly before nine o'clock, Emily Bly, the girl assistant at the fruit stall on the Marine Parade South, noticed the couple pass. The man was about 20 years old, the same height as the dead girl, and she didn't know whether he was fair or dark. He was dressed in a grey suit. At the yacht station... Remarkable evidence was also given by Hubert Baldroy, a boy of 13, who is the son of the attendant at the Yarmouth Yacht Station. He had known Dora Gray, he said, since the week before Whitsuntide, through her coming to inquire for the yacht flame belonging to Wrexham. Sometimes she came two or three times a week, and sometimes only once a fortnight. The flame did not come to Yarmouth until Monday, July 15th, and on the previous Sunday the girl told him that she had been to Lowestoft with a gentleman. She then went aboard the yacht Media, where she remained till the afternoon and only left when the yacht went away. She told the young Hubert on leaving the yacht station that she was going for a walk with a gentleman with whom she went to 
to Lowestoft. He saw her a fortnight before her death walking with five young men in yachting dress on North Quay near the yacht station. The hat found upon the murdered girl when her body was discovered on Monday, July 15th, was not the one she was wearing the day before. Mrs. Louisa Newman, wife of a chef living in Manby Road, said that the deceased, Dora Gray, first came into her service last summer and left at the end of the season. The witness re-engaged her last Whitsuntide and she continued in her service till Saturday, July 13th, when she left her house at nine in the evening. From June the 16th till the 24th, the deceased was away without leave. The witness saw her out on two days during that week's absence, and on Saturday, June 22nd, the deceased, Dora Gray, called and told the witness that she had been to Norwich. When she left the witness's house for the last time on Saturday, July 13th, she was wearing the same clothes as those she was wearing when found on the beach. The witness was, had never seen the deceased in a man's company. Miss Selina Eastick, with whom the deceased lived, said that she had never seen her with a young man or known her to keep company with one. During the week the deceased was away from Mrs Newman's, she came home every night to sleep, but the witness explained that she did not know at what time. Medical Evidence Dr Thomas Lettis, the police surgeon, described the position of the body which was lying on the east side of the parade where there was grass five or six feet from the roadway. There were no signs of any struggle. The deceased was lying on her back in a quiet, reposeful position with her arms by her side. The hands were not at all clenched. The fingers were slightly flexed. Her feet were bare and her shoes, one of which had no lace in it, were lying about a foot away. She had been strangled with the bootlace, tied very tightly twice around her throat with a reef knot. A pair of stockings was also tied around her throat with a reef knot. There was no sand on her face or hair or in her fingernails. Death had taken place about five hours earlier. With the exception of a few slight scratches on her chin and some slight abrasions under her chin, there were no external marks of violence. The post-mortem showed that all the signs were those of death from asphyxia. He did not think that the girl could have tied the shoelace round her neck tightly enough to have caused death. Dr Blake thought that the scratches and abrasions showed that the deceased died from the first turn of the shoelace and he saw no signs of drugging. William Lincoln Sutton, the public analyst from Norfolk and Suffolk, who analysed the stomach and contents, said that he found no evidence of the presence of any poisons. Evidence was given by a constable on finding a pair of gloves belonging to the dead girl 280 yards away from the body on hard ground, which left no trace of footprints. The coroner said that he could not but ask whether the murder took place where the deceased was found. Neither he nor they could unravel the mystery. The jury returned a verdict of willful murder against some person or persona unknown. Sadly, unlike the, unlike the Bennett case, Dora's murderer continued to elude the police. There were a number of false confessions to the crime, but none of them were viable by any evidence and the suspects were released. Dora, it was found, had also created a different persona from the excitement of yachts and motor cars. On her days off, she dressed more flamboyantly and became known as Dolly. There were few mourners for Dora at her funeral. Her two aunts, the clergyman, a friend and several reporters. As the other side of Dora emerged, it would seem the cold case became shelved. The coroner, Tolva Waters, stated, The deceased Dora Gray 
was apparently a respectable girl, but she might have gone out with young men. It was surmised that she might have chosen young men above her station. The sad case of Dora Gray remained unresolved. That concludes today's episode of Frightful Fridays, The Yarmouth Murders. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers, and with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories of a similar theme such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known, grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.